My name is Kevin Stone, and I'm one of the pastors here at Proclamation Church. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Proclamation Online. Here at Proclamation, our values are to engage all people, to grow as a family of God, to go because Christ came for us, and to proclaim Jesus and not ourselves. No matter your age, race, gender, or socioeconomic status, we want to engage you with the life-changing message of the gospel. We believe that the local church is God's plan. And while we're excited to serve you through these online resources, this should never replace your commitment to your local church. If you happen to live in the Nashville, Tennessee area, I want to personally invite you to one of our Sunday morning gatherings at either the 9 a.m. or 1045 a.m. service. If God is using this church to impact your life, you can partner with us financially by giving online through our website. And if this is your first time checking out Proclamation, we don't want you to feel compelled by us to give. We're just glad that you're here. We hope that this message helps you to fix your eyes on Jesus and helps drive you deeper into the gospel. Good morning, family. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. That is where we're going to be. We kick off a brand new series uh, last weekend called uh, Go and Proclaim, where we are going to be taking the next uh, several weeks uh, and just looking through the book of Acts, studying the book of Acts, um, and seeing uh, this spirit-led movement, how God used individuals to impact uh, not just their community, their local context, but ultimately the world in which we are we are a part of. Um, you know, one of the things that we spoke about last week was uh, what it looks like for us to be a part of a spirit-led movement. Um, and that has been my prayer, my hope uh, for us here at Proclamation Church, is that this isn't just something that we're putting together in our own schemes and our own abilities and our own talents, but we are following after uh, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, uh, that we are being led uh, into this movement to see people come to know Jesus. We are going to them. We are proclaiming the excellencies of Christ Jesus. And so that's what our hope is in this series, is that we are going to look at that um, and asking the question, what does that specifically look like, right? Now, <clears throat> for us, today we're going to look at, uh, you know, again, we spoke last week about being a part of this spirit-led movement, uh, but we are going to be looking at today about what does it look like for us to be filled by the Holy Spirit, right? If the Holy Spirit is the one leading and guiding, uh, there are aspects in Scripture where it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that, uh, that Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is going to come and fill them up. Um, and we want to talk specifically about what that looks like. Now, I'm going to say this. There's only so much that we can cover uh, when it comes to the subject of the Holy Spirit uh, in a 25 to 30 minute window. Um, for that reason, um, I want to share a couple of resources for you that have been helpful for me. Um, that hopefully they'll be helpful for you as, as well. Just some books uh, that if you enjoy reading, uh, if you want to uh, look up some of these things, you have that opportunity to do that. One of the easiest books to read on the subject of the Holy Spirit, in my opinion, uh, is called Forgotten God by Francis Chan. He wrote it several years ago, uh, about eight to ten years ago now at this point. And essentially he's talking about how the Holy Spirit is this Third, the third aspect of the Trinity that often gets overlooked and not really talked about. Um, but what we see is that that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is active and moving in the book of Acts. And so, uh, man, that's an easy book that you can read in a, in a weekend time. Uh, another easy book to read is A.W. Tozer's book, How to Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, super practical, uh, very easy book to read. Um, my pastor, J.D. Greer, he wrote a book called Jesus Continued. Uh, it's a summary of a lot of his different sermons, uh, some in the book of Acts, some on the Holy Spirit. Um, and in it, he compiles a lot of these sermons. And again, it's very practical, um, something I would highly recommend picking up. Uh, you can get into some weightier books, uh, and these are pretty heavy. These are, you know, a, a little bit more in depth. Um, but a theology for the church, there's a, there's a chapter in there that's dedicated specifically to the Holy Spirit. It's more of a theological a book, um, and another one, uh, and that's by Danny Aiken, um, and there's another book by R.C. Sproul, uh, R.C. Sproul called The Mystery of the Holy Spirit. Again, another deeper theological one, um, but those are books I would recommend picking up on the subject of the Holy Spirit because there are a lot of things that we're going to talk about today that if you did not grow up in church, if you're not familiar with the language of, like I just used of the Trinity, a lot of this stuff can kind of go over your head um, and so I would recommend picking those, those resources up, um, and I will try my best to not speak in Christianese today, okay? Um, now, hopefully you've already turned to it, but in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, <clears throat> When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. 
Uh, Luke is talking about the disciples. They are all together, uh, not only them, uh, but several others uh, who were uh, essentially in, we don't know if they were in the upper room or in uh, one specific room. It doesn't necessarily say, but they say, it does say that they were together specifically during Pentecost. Now, this is uh, really important for us to remember, okay? Uh, historically, uh, Pentecost uh, uh, served two purposes or had two meanings. One was agricultural and the other was historical, okay? Originally, it was the middle of three annual Jewish feasts, uh, Jewish festivals, uh, and it was either called the Feast of Harvest because it was celebrated at the completion of the grain harvest, or it's called the Feast of Weeks, um, or Pentecost, because it took place on the 50th day uh, after Passover. Um, and that word 50th in their language was uh, Pentecost. Uh, and so that's where we get that word from, okay? Now, we're going to hit on this a little bit later, but this is why we see uh, so many Jews, so many individuals together. <clears throat> what we're going to see next week is that 3,000 people come to know Jesus in one day, <clears throat> excuse me, after what takes place here. Uh, and the reason why is because a lot of these individuals were coming in from all over um, to celebrate uh, Pentecost, okay? Now, uh, verse 2 says, Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. Now, I want to make sure you understand this, because this was not just some cool breeze that, you know, fluttered the hair of the disciples like, you know, Beyonce at Coachella, and nothing like that. This was a mighty sound. It was a, 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 a loud, booming thing, okay? It's, think, think more of along the lines of the sound that you hear uh, when a tornado is coming through, right? Uh, never in my life did I think that I would live in an area that had uh, as many tornadoes as Middle Tennessee does, but here we are. Um, I've uh, sat underneath more tornado watches and warnings in my year and a half, almost two years of being here than I have my entire life. Uh, but what I've noticed in some of those watches and in those warnings, the wind is strong. It's loud. Uh, you can hear it, it, it whistling through. And they even say that when tornadoes come, it sounds like a train, right? And we know that it was so loud. The, the force of this sound was so loud because what we're going to notice is that people hear. People on the outside, they actually hear and they wonder what this noise was, okay? Now, if you're taking notes, this is the first thing I want you to understand about what it means to be filled with the Spirit, okay? The very first thing is this. You can't be filled with the Spirit until you obey and follow Jesus, okay? You can't be filled with the Spirit until you obey and follow Jesus. Now, let's take into consideration everything that we just looked at, everything that we just read, okay? The Holy Spirit has finally come. He's finally come. Remember early on in the book of Acts uh, and uh, even um, in Matthew, we see Jesus tell the disciples to kind of wait and to chill because the Holy Spirit is coming. And when the Holy Spirit has come, he is now going to change the entire trajectory of history as we know it. But when does it happen? It happens when the disciples are obedient to what Jesus told them to do. Again, going back to Acts chapter 1, specifically verse 4. He says this, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, verse 5, John, John, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What we see is Jesus told them to wait, and what did they do? They waited. They waited. So what does that communicate? Number one, it communicates obedience. Not only did they wait, but we didn't read this last week, and we're not going to read it, you know, in its entirety. But there's a there's a section of scripture um, uh, in Acts chapter one, right in between these events that's happening, uh, specifically in verse 14. It says this: All of these, all these disciples, all these together were in one accord, devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Did you catch that? Did you catch what they were doing while they were waiting? They were praying together. They were putting into practice the very thing that they asked Jesus to teach them to do. They asked Jesus, hey, don't you could teach us how to be a great communicator. You could teach us how to cast out demons. You could teach us you know, how to be a great miracle worker. All these things they could have asked Jesus, but no, they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And we see them putting into practice what they learned from their master. 
They were obedient to Jesus by doing what he told them to do, and then they were following the way of Jesus by practicing what he showed them in prayer. Family, listen to me. There is no being filled with the Spirit apart from following and obeying Jesus. You cannot be the final decision maker when it comes to seeing a movement of God. You know, I confessed this last weekend in our, in our gatherings in, in person that there are often times when I will strategize and scheme and, and think through and write down all these plans and all these different things uh, to, for, the, for the work of the church. And oftentimes I do that in my own strength apart from prayer and asking the Lord to move. Could you imagine what would have happened if the disciples decided to do what I do, or oftentimes what we all do? I'll tell you what would have happened. God would have raised up other leaders to get the job done, right? We cannot think that we're going to see change take place in our community, that we're going to see healing happen in our families, unity inside and outside of the church by simply willing those things into existence in our own strength. We must obey and follow Jesus. To see these things happen. So here's a question for you to consider this morning. Where in my life am I operating in my own will and ignoring the will of Jesus? I want you to write that down. Where in my life am I operating in my own will and ignoring the will of Jesus? You see, if you were here with us last weekend, we spent significant time talking about spirit-led movements, right? And spirit-led movements can never be led by the spirit if we are relying on being led by ourselves. What Jesus is telling you to do, excuse me, what is Jesus telling you to do that you refuse to be obedient into? What is that sin that you refuse to let go of? What is that desire that you keep feeding? What is that idol that you keep bowing down to? What is he calling you to follow him to do, but yet you're still choosing to follow something else? Because here's the thing, when we are obeying And when we are following Jesus, we'll notice a difference in our life, which leads us to the second thing this morning. When you're filled with the Spirit, your life is marked by change. When you are filled with the Spirit, your life is marked by change. Look at verse 3. It says this, And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages, as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. Now, let me be clear here. Obeying and following Jesus does not mean Tongues like flames should be evident in your life, okay? It does not mean that. There are individuals who truly believe that you are not a follower of Jesus unless you're speaking in tongues. That is not true, okay? I will say this, though. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, there should be a noticeable change in your life in what you could do before he came and what you're able to do now that he's come, okay? This is what I mean by that. There are two meanings in Scripture being filled with the Spirit. One is at the moment of conversion where the Holy Spirit has come into your life. You are filled, you are sealed with His promise and with His presence. This is what Jesus refers to in Acts chapter 1 when He says you're being baptized in the Spirit, okay? When He says you're being baptized, essentially saying you are being immersed into His presence. And that happens the instant that you trust Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, okay? But the second meaning of being filled with the Spirit is this. There are moments when the Spirit, who you are already filled with, comes in in unique ways and illuminates more of Christ and who He is. We see that in John chapter 16. And, and, and what we see of Christ and who He is and what people are seeing or what we're showing of uh, people, Christ, in our lives, right? What this means specifically is that there are moments when we are reminded of the beauty of Jesus when the Holy Spirit is bringing these things, illuminating those things in our lives. Or when we share something uh, with others, right, of what God is teaching us, what the Holy Spirit is teaching us. The Spirit is giving us a fresh feeling that allows us to experience God again and again and again. And when we're able to see the love and grace of Christ in our lives more clearly, our hearts will always trend towards awe and worship, which pushes us towards obedience and surrender, which ultimately produces spirit-empowered change. In fact, what we're going to see next week is that these individuals who hear the gospel in their own language, they begin to form this countercultural community to put on display for the world to see. What we see is that they're changed drastically, and it's because of the work of the Spirit in their life. No, I know you're thinking, okay, that's, that's cool, Derek, right? 
But the change that we see here in the text is them speaking in tongues, right? The disciples, what they couldn't do beforehand and what they're able to do now after the Spirit comes is speaking in tongues. What's that about? Well, I'm glad you asked, and Dr. Luke breaks this down for us. Look at verse 5. He says, There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Alamites, those who live in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, uh, Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking the magnificent acts of God in our own languages. Guys, what's taking place here is a miracle, okay? This is a miracle. These tongues were actual human languages, okay? Now, this is different from the tongues that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians uh, when Paul is talking about a spiritual language that comes upon you uh, as one of the spiritual gifts, okay? This is completely different. <clears throat> there were people there from all over the world. Remember what was happening? Pentecost, people were coming in. They were celebrating this festival, right? And, and you had listeners saying, uh, as they were proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ, they're saying, yo, I understand that. I, I, I understand what they're saying. They are telling me the gospel in my own language, even though they don't know my own language, right? They said, these guys, aren't they Galileans? Like, there's no reason why they should know my native tongue. What's happening here, guys, again, is a miracle. If I could break it down for you a little bit more, you see in Genesis 15 and 17, God tells Abraham that he is going to be the father of many nations, right? Many nations. Now, before that, back in Genesis 9, we see Noah uh, in the ark, right? The flood takes place and uh, Noah tells, or God tells Noah and his sons to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth, right? However, when we get to Genesis chapter 11, we see that these, the offspring of Noah and his sons, essentially they're like, you know what? We don't like this idea of being fruitful and multiplying. In fact, they say, no, we're going to build. build. And this is where we see the Tower of Babel come into place, right? In fact, we see that their building was direct disobedience to what God told Noah and his children. They said, and I quote, let's build here lest we disperse over the face of the earth, right? God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they said, nope, let's build here so we don't disperse and fill the earth. And so what did God do? He used tongues at the Tower of Babel to confuse them so that these individuals could lump up and go uh, uh, and finally spread across the earth the way that God wanted them to. God used their sin to push them to do what he commanded in the first place. Now, here's the thing, you see. God used different languages to disperse the people of the world to fulfill what he commanded, to fill the earth with image bearers. God never desired to see separation happen. He desired obedience. And now we find ourselves here in Acts chapter 2. What confused the people in Genesis 11 is what brings them together now in Acts chapter 2. Why is this important to know? Okay, I share all that to say this. If we spend our time focusing on the miracle of tongues being used, we miss out on the purpose of why the miracle had to take place. God was starting to finally fulfill his promise to Abraham back in Genesis 15 and 17, that he would be the father of many nations, that through him, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation would be blessed, that they would be part of God's forever family. Here's the thing that we need to understand here. The first time the gospel was preached, it was preached in all languages simultaneously. What were they saying? It says that they were talking about the magnificent acts of God. Megalia is the word that's used here. It means miraculous acts of God and salvation. You see, in the Old Testament, this was great works of salvation for Israel. Here, it's the gospel. Here's the truth of Jesus and who he is, an experience of the gospel that is pushing them to now proclaim the gospel to others. Our good friend Tim Keller, he says this, if the apostles had only spoken in Greek or Aramaic or Hebrew, the signal would have been set that the gospel was primarily for one people group. But instead, the Lord on Pentecost shows the world 
through a deliberate miracle that no language and no culture has privilege over the other, the other in the kingdom of God. Isn't that beautiful? The gospel is for every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. The first worship service is multilingual, multicultural, multiracial in the extreme. That leads us to the next thing that we see this morning is this. Individuals filled with the Spirit proclaim a gospel to all people. Individuals filled with the Spirit proclaim a gospel to all people. There's a reason why one of our values here at Proclamation Church is that we want to be a church that engages all people. We want to be a reflection of our community. Did you know that our zip code, 37211, uh, has over 75,000 people in it, okay? And of that 75,000 people, over 75,000 people, this is the racial makeup of this zip code. It's extremely diverse. It's 52% white, 20% Hispanic, 16% black or African American, 8% Asian, and then other. Now, you want to know what the makeup of our local church is, our gathering, Proclamation Church? Based off the surveys that we actually did a month ago, we are able to uh, bring these numbers to you, okay? Our church is 79% white and 21% minority. There are two observations here with that. Number one, according to church growth experts, we meet the criteria for being a multi-ethnic church. And essentially what they say with that is you got to be 80-20, it's the 80-20 rule. Um, you, we meet the criteria to be in a multi-ethnic church, right? But the second observation is this. We don't look like our community. We don't look like our community. I share that not because I wanted our church to be marked by diversity. Yeah, that's great and that's fantastic. But I share that because I want our church to be marked by the Spirit. We engage all people because all people is a focus of the heart of God. Listen, guys. Being a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church is not primary. The gospel is primary. However, being a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church is a direct implication of the gospel. How can I say that? Acts chapter 2. We have to fight to remember that the second greatest diverse area outside of heaven is hell. People will not be with Jesus unless they understand the depths of their sin, the reality of their need of a Savior, and they're putting their complete trust in Jesus as the one who can save them by living the perfect life that they couldn't live and dying the death that they should have died. Listen, when they rest in his grace and perfection, then they will experience life eternal. That's the reality. That is the message that we're going to proclaim with everything that we have. This message is primary to what we do. And if that's the case, then there is no room for partiality when it comes to who hears about Jesus and who doesn't. There's no room for cultural norms. No no room for cultural norms that says that my cultural norms are better than their cultural norms when it comes to the gospel. The Spirit brings us together under the Lordship of Christ, and it unifies us to be a new family, which leads me to the last thing this morning. When we are filled with the Spirit, it will always lead us and others to look and see Jesus. We're filled with the Spirit, always lead us and others to look and see Jesus. There's something happening here in this section of Scripture that I want us to see. Why does God send the Holy Spirit down specifically on the day of Pentecost? Now, a lot of theologians, a lot of people smarter than me says that there's a lot of rich symbolism that's taking place here, okay? This was, this was 50 days after Passover, which Passover is a celebration of when God gathered the people to Mount Sinai. In both cases, there was wind and fire that's happening, right? There was this overwhelming presence of God there. It came down, it frightened God's people, and there was a message given from God to people. But here's the difference here, okay? On Mount Sinai, that message was a message of law, right? And the people feared it. The people realized that they couldn't live by it, even though as, they, as much as they tried, right? They couldn't even touch the mountain. They had to send Moses to go up into this fiery presence of, to God on their behalf. And, God, and then they begged God for forgiveness, right? That became Moses' role for, for him and the people, right? Standing in the gap between sinful people and the presence of God. They couldn't bear to even hear his voice. But when the Spirit comes down at Pentecost, what happens? It comes after Jesus has proclaimed and carried out the message of grace, not law but grace. 
The veil has been torn, separating the people from God. Purifying fire of God was torn right top to bottom. And because the blood of Jesus washes away our sin, we can now be in the presence of God. We can step into the presence of God boldly and in faith because of everything that Jesus has done for us. And now at Pentecost, Jews from all over the world are being brought back into the presence of God. Pentecost was also known as the Feast of Harvest, at Harvest as I shared earlier, right? Where they celebrated God's faithfulness by giving their first fruits to him. And the result of Pentecost, as we'll see uh, uh, later on, is that 3,000 people come to know Jesus, right? Peter preaches this sermon. 3,000 people give their life to Jesus. This is God's power poured out for the purpose of bringing people to himself. A people filled with the Spirit are ready to obey and follow Jesus. Their lives are changed. They proclaim the gospel to the nations, which causes them and others to see Jesus for who he is. Question for you today. Is this you? Can you say that you are filled with the Spirit? Are you you willing to obey and to follow Jesus where he tells you to go and do what he tells you to do? Are you, are you, is your mark, is your life marked by change because the Holy Spirit is revealing things in you? He's, he's illuminating things to you where you realize that there are things in your life that don't line up with Jesus that you're seeking to change. That, that what your life looked like beforehand is now different because of what the Holy Spirit has done. Are you proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus to the nations? Are you proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus to anyone? Is it, is it so important to you that, that it just flows out of you? Man, do you look at Jesus and see him for who he is? These are the things that we need to ask ourselves. A.W. Tozer once said this, Unbelief says some other time, but not now. Some other place, but not here. Some other people, but not us. Faith says anything he did anywhere else, he will do here. Anything he did any other time, he is willing to do now. Anything he ever did for other people, he is willing to do for us. With our feet on the ground and our head cool, but with our heart ablaze with the love of God, we walk out in this fullness of the Spirit if we will yield and obey. Guys, God wants to work through you. The counselor has come and he doesn't care about the limits of locality, geography, time, or nationality. The body of Christ is bigger than all of these. The question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Will we open our hearts? The Spirit wants to fill us to do something, and specifically for the sake of the context of our series, to fill us up to go and proclaim. Will you do that? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you again for this opportunity to open up your word. I pray, God, that here in this moment that we would rest in who you are and what you're doing in our lives. Father, be with us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.